cloud. Okay. All right, so we're going to have uh, three people speaking today. Uh, unfortunately, one of our speakers, Roy Fox, is not going to be able to make it due to an emergency. Um, so it'll be only the three of us. Um, today's session is uh, loosely cognition and reinforcement learning. And um, so the first talk will be um, uh, Andrea Stucco here. Um, and he will uh, be talking about reinforcement learning and gradually we'll move towards cognition. Uh, and with um, uh, Terry Stewart and uh, well, uh, the third talk would be Benjamin Cellier from, uh, from Montreal and, and he'll be talking uh, about equilibrium propagation. Um, so I think without further ado, Andrea, I, I think we should, um, uh, we can start right away. Uh, so you should be able to show your screen. Okay, I'm gonna start right now. Can I, can I just mention something, Emre? Do you mention oh, yes. that people can have questions on the chat so, and so also that's, Slack? That's correct. So, so this, um, in this session, so we're not going to have those Slido questionnaires because that's um, a little bit too much uh, for organizers to check all three uh, places. So you're, you're welcome to ask questions on the chat and on the questions channel of the, of, of the Slack. Um, and uh, uh, we will uh, try to monitor those channels and uh, and ask the questions. Um, also, potentially, you know, uh, uh, interrupting maybe the speaker um, uh, with those questions. So, uh, so please keep those questions coming, and uh, let's uh, hope this will work out. Okay. Did you want to add anything, Shichi, about that? I think it's great. Yes, guys, do do ask questions. It will make for a good discussion. Okay, great. Thank you. Andrea, I think you can you can start sharing your screen. And there we... Okay, we can see your desktop. You should be like switching to presentation mode right now. Can you yep. please confirm that yes. actually this looks legit? Yep. Yeah, all good. All right, perfect. Thanks everybody. It's really been like amazing actually to be here for the first time. I've been like overdosing on amazing talks. Uh, my, my talk is going to be somewhat like less computational and more oriented to like lab-based experiments. I hope you can still enjoy it. I'm actually looking forward to really uh, listening to your question and talking to all of you. So uh, I'm going to start with like a very, very brief like exposition of reinforcement learning. I'm sure that many of you are already familiar with it, but just in case, and just to make sure that we are all on the same page. So the idea of reinforcement learning is that uh, essentially you have a basic agent that interacts to the, with an environment and the agent just learns a little bit to perform actions that are maximally useful in the long term. And it does this by keeping track of what are the rewards in the universe and basically calculating what is the expected value of any single action, which is represented by this value B. And uh, this, this value represents basically the expected number of future rewards. And the best way to calculate what is this value is to keep a temporal difference method. Uh, which is basically just upgrading the current value based on the difference between two different estimates. So in this case, you can see that this was my previous expectation on the value of a state or an action, and I'm mm -hmm. updating it based on the previous value plus a fraction of what is the current reward that I'm getting, the new estimate scaled by a temporal discounting factor, and the previous estimate. If I do this over time, uh, I actually converge over a, a good representation of what are actually the best uh, actions to perform over time. And technically speaking, this guy here as a technical term or reward prediction error. Now, this is like a beautiful theory. The connection with the brain comes to the fact that in the late 90s, a bunch of neuroscientists and computational neuroscientists discovered that this theory predicts absurdly well uh, the behavior of dopamine neurons firing in the midbrain. And by absurdly, brain, absurdly well, it means uh, this level of precision. So this actually, this is classic data from Wolfram Schultz laboratory. And this was a behavior of dopamine neurons that was like puzzling for many, many years. And neurons essentially had this strange behavior that occurs like when a primate is doing a trial and there is an unexpected reward, well, dopamine really gets excited. But then when learning has occurred, all of a sudden dopamine fires when the cue appears, but it's very flat when the reward happens. And if for some reason the cue appears, but there is no reward, well, dopamine is depressed at the moment of reward, but still appears to the cue. And this matches very well with the terms in this equation. The reward 
sometimes will produce a reward when it's, when it's unexpected, but not when it's learned, and it will definitely produce a depression because dopamine is really not tracking the reward, not tracking the value, but it's tracking the reward prediction error. Now, generally speaking, uh, this will be implemented in an agent. Uh, there are many ways to implement this in an agent, but a common way to do it is called an actor critic system. When you have like a critic that is constantly evaluated how well uh, your estimates are doing, and an actor that is associating state with possible like actions and policies. Uh, this turned out to match very well with the basic ganglia, which is kind of like the focus of what I'm going to talk about today, which is the set of nuclei uh, in between the midbrain. And the remarkable match between like uh, a model, a genetic architecture, and the nuclear brain, a basal ganglia is what give rise to this idea that basal ganglia in a sense are the brain's reinforcement learning system. And the evidence from neuroscience is massive. Like, so uh, for those of you who are familiar with neuroscience, which is this kind of like corpus online navigate uh, website where you can navigate like thousands and thousands of study. If you go there and just do a meta-analysis online of like, all the studies that contain reward anticipation, which is in essence what the reward prediction error could be used for. Well, you find, of course, like that the common ground or the common element of all the studies is uh, the basal ganglia, in particular, like the part of the basal ganglia that is receiving projection from dopamine. But if you just do something that is related to reward prediction, like let's say decision making, you also found the basal ganglia. And this has led to the theory that essentially when we're doing decision making, we're just using a uh, reward prediction error and essentially the same machinery that we would use for, uh, for reinforcement learning to make decisions. And if you just use a way more generic uh, term like learning, now the number of studies that we are doing meta-analysis for raises to more than 1,000, we still find uh, the same area of the brain and roughly the same, area, the same like part, basal ganglia and dopamine centers uh, showing up in this meta-analysis. So you can see this is like a very consensual view of what the basic ganglia is doing. Is there to do learning? Is there to do like essentially assigning a value to the possible space of options that are there in front of us? Andrea, I have a, a, yeah. a, com a question from the audience. They cannot see your pointer. They cannot see my pointer, the red pointer? Yes. Yeah. Oh, no. It, it updates very slowly. Okay. Uh, I'm going to do uh, something very quick. If you give me a second. In the past, one thing that helped was actually to turn off my camera. I have a very slow laptop. <laughs> Can you still see? Uh, no, you can't because... Give me one more second to restart sharing the screen. There was another question from the audience too, maybe that just appeared there, Emre. Do you see that? Yeah, people were asking whether or not the, they were surprised by that last one that why isn't the hippocampus coming up? But that's what the data says. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, there is also a confound here that comes from just the, the peculiarities of neuroimaging. Uh, the hippocampus is a little bit more difficult to image than the basal ganglia. But so, for those uh, of you who are interested in the hippocampus, these two specs here. It, it, uh, there also, there's two different memory systems. You're, you're talking about a procedural memory system here, which involves the basal ganglia and the cortex. But the declarative system, which the hippocampus is part of, is involved in things that you can, uh, events and unique objects and things that you can talk about, which is a different, very different memory system. D different okay. experiments. And, and, uh, and to be fair, like there is a bias in what this 1000 uh, studies will be uh, showing up. I, I bet that if you actually go and analyze the studies, a lot of them are actually learning in the sense of motor learning or skill learning, which of course will load more to the procedural learning system more than the declarative. But if I had gone a little bit down on the z-axis, uh, the presence of these two specs here will, will, makes me think that actually I would have actually found the hippocampus as well. Um, just to confirm, is my pointer updating a little bit faster now? Uh, Not really. You move, uh, move your pointer. No. no, it's okay. All right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna instead of point, I'm gonna describe verbally. 
so that we can actually agree on the joint reference. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so in the late 2000s, early 2010s, there were a bunch of people, including myself and including Terry, actually, who's gonna present after me, and most importantly, Michael Frank uh, and Randy Riley, who actually pushed forward this idea that we can probably make it take uh, a, a, a bigger jump and say that uh, the role of the Bizarre Gang is probably bigger than we thought about. And it, it involves not only learning and associating values to particular specific actions that could be motor actions or particular options in a decision-making uh, you know, um, framework, but it could be generally to modulate cortical activities. If you can imagine that uh, the particular action that is selected by the Bizarre Ganglia is just opening and closing gates to prefrontal cortex, you can imagine then that the reinforcement learning as implemented by the basic ganglia could be involved in modulating uh, cortical cortical dynamics on a massive scale. And this set uh, many of us off on a course to actually see if this was true. Because the implication would be that the effect of basic ganglia on cognition would be much wider than we thought before. So in the rest of this talk, I'm gonna actually kind of like focus on a subset of these results from, from my lab. And I'm not gonna get into effective connectivity patient studies or reliability studies. I'm gonna just hint at the effective connectivity part at the very end. But I'm gonna show you three behavioral studies and one fMRI study that um, you know, link this reinforcement learning part with what is typically associated with higher level cognition and in the world of neuroimaging, it's typically associated only with cortical processing and not subcortical processes, let alone with reinforcement learning. And I'm going to start with going back to the basal ganglia and digging a little bit deeper, just a little bit, on the neuroanatomy. Because if we look at how the basal ganglia is wired up, we realize that it's not perfectly captured by, standard way, uh, by the standard way in which reinforcement algorithms are described. So this is like a, a very simple, actually, uh, wire diagram of the basic game. But very simple, it means that many connections are actually omitted. And generally speaking, physiologists divide all these connections into two sets. There is a set of connections that is in green, that is called the direct pathway. And the overall effect of this connection is actually to have an excited, excited effect on the prefrontal cortex by inhibiting the thalamus, disinhibiting the thalamus, sorry. And then there is another set of connections called the indirect pathway that has the opposite effect. Ends up actually um, having an inhibitor effect on the thalamus and therefore reducing the excitatory connections on prefrontal cortex. Uh, Michael Frank, for instance, uh, has popularized the use of go and no go pathways for these two connections. Uh, they are separated. The neurons are actually highly uh, overlapping. If you actually try to stain them, they are not separated into different blocks, but they are actually, uh, they form separated pathways that are also marked by having different receptors and different neural cells. In particular, like the red pathway here expresses D2 receptors, the green pathway expresses D1 receptors, which means that also they respond differently to dopamine. Now, this is particularly interesting because uh, if we look at standard reinforcement learning algorithms, they actually do not distinguish between two different pathways. And interesting enough, Standard reinforcement learning is known to be biased. It systemic, systematically overestimates V for the worst options. This is because when you couple reinforcement learning with a normal policy, at a certain point it will stop sampling from the bad options and it will just start picking for the good options. Typically leaving the bad options with somewhat uh, biased estimates and over-optimistic estimates. A number of connections uh, have been proposed to this. Um, most famously like the so-called double Q learning by Van Asselt. Uh, and typically all these connections, all these corrections have some form of like anti-actions where you try to get, give like a negative value, for instance, to things that are the opposite action of what you have ended up doing. The dual pathways, in a sense, work in this way. When one pathway is reinforced, the other is inhibited. When, when one pathway learns, the other doesn't learn or anti-learns. And here is actually a simulation that we've done with my student, Patrick Rice, where we showed that uh, if we actually do something like calculate the amount of estimate that the basal ganglia or the reinforcement learning algorithm does in sampling the value of the bad options, uh, we see that generally speaking, the estimate error increases uh, over time as we try to get closer and closer to a certain level of accuracy 
for the good options. But if we implement these forms of corrections, in this case, we call them biologically plausible basal ganglia corrections, uh, we can actually get good levels of accuracy without having this estimate error for the bad options, which is, of course, like biologically convenient because it means that if you're an agent and you live in an environment where there are several risky options, if all of a sudden the good options are missing, you don't risk to die. You don't end up like taking like selfies with the bears like we were discussing before. So if these direct and indirect pathways are important and are an important physiological correlate of the two basal ganglia, we need to have a measure to, we need to have a way to measure it. And this is the interesting part because it's really hard to measure them unless you do some kind of like really deep uh, neurophysiological measure. And of course, like for most of the uh, human level research, this is almost impossible to do. Uh, in 2004, Frank kind of solved this problem by proposing this interesting uh, behavioral task that we call the PSS task, probabilistic stimulus selection. And the idea about this task is that we can do something like a probabilistic dual choice um, decision-making task with multiple options. In this case, like options are presented in fixed pairs with uh, different varying degrees of like having a reward associated to each option. And within each, within each pair, there is a good option and a bad option. And the degree of difference between the good and the bad option decreases. And people are asked to pick uh, from these pairs, one of the two options, until they reach a criteria, until they are stable in selecting the best option. A over B, C over D, E over F. Uh, the option are typically given some kind of like, uh, in this case, in the original version, it was Japanese characters. We changed it to like other scripts because the idea is that they should be non-verbalizable symbols. So that we are trying to really tap into the procedural learning system rather than, you know, other forms of learning. The key is that for each pair, you can learn to pick the good one or to avoid the bad one. And it's impossible to distinguish them normally unless you switch to the test phase. In the test phase, all the options are mixed together. So you can see not only A versus B, but also A versus D, E versus D, C versus F. And what we really care about is this particular contrast. I'm going to see if I can actually slowly update this too. The contrast where A is paired against all the other options, I'm going to call this choose A. And the contrast in which B is paired against all the other options, I'm going to call this avoid B, or just simply choose and avoid. As it turns out, choose and avoid track very closely, not perfectly, but track very closely the activity of the direct and indirect pathways. And this has been shown in multiple studies using like Parkinson on and off medication. For instance, Parkinson patients, when they are off medication, tend to become avoiders. But if you put them on medication, which gives them an overshot of dopamine, they become choosers. It also is true in people who have an expression of like uh, dopamine D1 receptors due to genetic makeup, essentially. Uh, they tend to be uh, choosers, but once they express less of this gene, uh, again, for the, because of the genetic makeup, they become avoiders. And it's true also when they have a, a D2 polymorphism, when they have more expression of D2, they are avoiders, when they have less expression of D2, they are choosers. Uh, one other interesting thing that you may wonder is whether choose and avoid are correlated with each other, and they are not. So uh, if you take a random person in the lab, they may be choosers, they may be avoiders, or they might be balanced. They might be, generally speaking, everywhere in this uh, plane where we plot choose accuracy, and uh, actually, this is the wrong, sorry, I put the wrong graph here. Uh, choose accuracy and uh, avoid accuracy. Now, I'm going to use these two measures, choose and avoid, in a three different experiments that track language, attention, and fluid intelligence to show that we can track the individual differences that participants have in their expression of like preferences for choosing or avoiding, that somehow track down to or reflect these individual differences in the function. And we can see that there are systematic differences in these three domains, in language, attention, and fluid intelligence. And this is interesting because it points directly to the fact that uh, these reinforcement learning properties of these mid-cortical nuclei reflect then how people perform in these higher level cognitive functions. And the way we did this is by a series of actually abstractions. So uh, at the beginning, uh, we had this 
um, computational model of the basic ganglia, a neural network essentially, of the basic ganglia function that contain a detailed representation of the um, basic ganglia circuit and the different pathways. This is what you see uh, on the very left of the screen. But then since we had to create actually models that do more complicated things, we abstracted away this and we just um, simplified and put it in a current architecture, ACTAR. And this is a convenience choice. We can take this, put it into ACTAR, ACTAR makes it easy to prototype uh, models that make more complicated tasks. Uh, but we can still maintain a, a certain degree of plausibility because there are some mappings that we can do between different parts of ACTAR and different parts of the brain. So we can record also brain image at the same time. Importantly, ACTAR is uh, something that corresponds to the basal ganglia, and we try to maintain that part of ACTAR uh, functionally corresponding to our idea of how the basal ganglia work by splitting this rules of engagement of the procedural model in ACTAR into two different components. Uh, we call it pick and dump pick rules that actually reflect the two different versions of reinforcement learning. Uh, this is actually how the model does when it is empowered with this system that has a pick and don't pick component with the true reinforcement learning rules uh, that are modulated by these uh, parameters that reflect the dopamine expression D1 and D2. And you can see that first and foremost, the model does reasonably good at fitting the data from patient and health individuals with a different expression of genetic, um, oh, sorry, alleles that express the, effect the D1 and D2 receptors. Now, once we have this model captured and we have a good idea of what is like having high D2 and our D1 and how this translates into choose and avoid performance on the main task, we can now drive predictions for how people will do in the different tasks, the language attention and food intelligence tasks. And let's start with language. And this is what we have done with uh, our previous graduate student, Jose, who is now at Google. Um, the task that we picked was this particular task, which is semantic ambiguity resolution. And this is what happens when you read sentences like this. The bank was so dirty that the fish were dying. And when you read a sentence like this, of course, it doesn't really make sense. And probably if you were reading this sentence, your reading pattern would be like this. You would read very fast, uh, marked here as in green, when you were like going like, the bank was so dirty that. And then you would find the fish and you would pause a little bit. And then at the word die, you would actually stop and, and actually wonder what, what is the sentence about. And then you would go back and realize the bank was actually not the money bank, but it was actually the river bank that was what implied. This is the semantic ambiguity solution. Some words, of course, have multiple meanings, and sometimes you have to pick not the dominant meaning, but the subordinate meaning. Now, this is typically uh, an effect that is studied in language and is super known, super well understood, but it's typically studied in the, in the, in the context of like uh, cortical function, right? There is very well-known studies that see that uh, the activation of particular regions in the prefrontal cortex are associated with this effect, for instance. Uh, interesting enough, there is an entire neuropsychological literature that shows that people with basal ganglia problems, like Parkinson patients, also have problems with this, but they are typically a bit dismissed. And so we wonder whether actually individual differences in how people perform uh, the PSS task, the tracks of these choose and avoid differences, would also reflected in semantic uh, ambiguity resolution. So we uh, tested this by using like, kind of like a reading task is a bit complicated, but we use like a task that is designed to capture semantic ambiguity resolution in a lab way. So we present a target word like bang. Then there are two different intervals, a very short interval and a very long interval in which uh, nothing happens, but we let the, 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 the semantic system access the meaning of the first word. Typically, the subordinate meaning can be accessed only at longer intervals. Uh, and then as a second word, the probe is presented, in this case is river, which of course like, is not the dominant secondary word associated. And then we ask people to decide whether the, the second word is associated or not with the first. Now, of course, we created a model. We have a model that is built in ACTAR and can use exactly the same parameters as the model that I've shown you that does the PSS task. And it's based on the same trick of having the procedural rules split into two different reinforcement learning components. And we use the parameters of the PSS task to simulate essentially like what would happen if the model were to choose for many years and learn what is the relative advantage of picking the dominant subordinate meeting for many, many, many iterations in normal conversations. And then we were asked to do the task. What happens is that the model makes a very specific prediction that there is really no difference across conditions for long and short 
uh, intervals or for subordinate and dominant meanings. But he predicts crucially that when it comes to accessing subordinate meanings for long uh, intervals, people who are uh, either avoiders or choosers should be like slightly better than chance. People who are actually equally good at being avoided or choosers, people we call balance, should be essentially a chance. This is a prediction that the model makes and it, it, it's very strong, somehow very strong in, in our model. It's been the only condition which the model makes uh, a prediction that is different based on the effects of the choose and avoid condition. Uh, so we tested it. And to our surprise, that actually panned out fairly well. So uh, you can see that across all the eight different experimental conditions, there's really no difference between choose avoiders or uh, balanced people, except for this subordinate condition along ISI, where the data pans out exactly as predicted by the model. We choose us and avoiders uh, having an accuracy of about 0.6, but balanced people being again as chance. Andrea, you had one question. Um, yes, so please. Asking whether that was a Winograd schema. Whether that was a what? A Winograd schema in the previous slide. This one? What is, I, I'm sorry, I'm not understanding. What is a Winograd schema? Semantic ambiguity. No? Okay. Uh, no. Okay, so, so let's, let's just... I, I got, I got to do, uh, I, I think I understand. Um, can I answer this question actually in, in, the, in the discussion on, uh, uh, on Slack? Okay, or, yeah, that, yeah, certainly, yeah. 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 I'll just copy it over. Perfect. Please go ahead. Okay, uh, second experiment. I'm gonna get now to uh, another part, which is attention. Uh, in, this, in this case, we use actually a different task, which is the Simon task. And the Simon task is a kind of like a visual attention executive function task in which shapes are presented on different sides of the screen. And uh, um, well, there is a rule essentially that maps the shape uh, to the handle you need to respond to. So for instance, you have a rule that is like, if it's a square, please respond with the left hand. If it's a circle with the right hand, uh, but of course, the trick is that in incongruent trials, the shapes are presenting on the opposite side. And unsurprisingly, when you have to respond with the left hand to a shape that is on the right, uh, it takes longer. Uh, this is a well-known effect. Uh, the real explanation is like much discussed, but we suspected that this could be also associated with basic the function. And again, we created uh, another model that again processes the different features of an algebra based on this competition between um, different rules, between different actions in the basic ganglia. And again, the model makes this prediction that actually, if you have like, uh, if you vary one of the two parameters, the one parameter is actually the standard parameter, the one for like actions, uh, there is not much of an effect on the Simon task. But if you vary the parameter that actually modulates anti-action that actually withdraws from processing something, there is a huge effect on the Simon task. And again, we found out that this is true and pans out in the data. We found out that most of the sampling effect, uh, sorry, we found out that the sampling effect is correlated in the behavioral data with um, the avoid performance on the PSS task. And this is true both in incongruent trials only and with the difference between congruent and incongruent trials. So I'm running a little bit short and I know we have a little bit extra time, but I would like to be respectful of the time. So I'm gonna flash through the last experiment, which is probably the most interesting, which is done with Lauren Graham, our, our postdoc, uh, which is fluid intelligence. And this is uh, probably the highest form of like type of reasoning. And it's typically measured with nonverbal tests such as Raven's advanced progressive, progressive matrices. And just to give you an idea, uh, you're probably all familiar with this. These are this type of reasoning task where you are presented with a matrix that you see like here on the left-hand side of visual shapes. And you are asked, what is the shape that will complete this particular matrix and go in the missing cell? And you're giving a set of options. Uh, this is really interesting because it uh, requires you to filter out possible patterns that would complete the, the, the figure and requires you to reevaluate your choices multiple times. For instance, like uh, here on the right hand side, 
uh, you see a classic common um, line of reason, it doesn't really pan out. You can pick like, for instance, in the top row, you can pick like the curve lines as being an important feature, and then you're lost because there is no curve lines in the um, top row at the end of the row. So you realize, then you go down like in the, in the, in the bottom figure, that actually the best way to analyze the row is actually not to consider the curve lines, but to consider everything that is vertical. So you, you see that there are two curve lines, three straight lines, and one thick line as the relevant feature. And then you can start a pattern that this particular vertical um, objects vary in, in shape and in number. And this is the particular feature that you need to latch on to examine this. Now, of course, this is re relevant in many ways because it requires processing visual features like the Simon task. So we essentially built a model. It is like a model of the Simon task, but on steroids. Uh, and we cannot really put the full diagram, but this is like a, a simplified version of how the model does this particular task. And again, we found out that the model predicts that for different levels of other parameters, here you have a tau parameter that is essentially like a timing interval that the model decides when it cannot wait any longer to process a particular problem because you never know when you're done in this particular uh, open-ended problems. Uh, but there is an effect of this D2 parameter, the capacity to avoid certain actions on accuracy, but there is no effect on the D1 parameter. So again, we set it out to test it out and we did the first experiment, again, comparing uh, performance on the PSS task with performance on the, on the Ravens. This is a really a messy task, but performance is much variable. So we need to unpack our number of participants. But again, the correlations pan out. There is a correlation with avoid, there is no correlation with accuracy, and the difference is significant. We replicated the experiment just to be sure. And again, correlation pans out in exactly the same, the same direction. Correlation is found with avoid, there is no, dif no correlation with accuracy, the difference is significant. So we did the experiment in the scanner also because the Raven's task is so complicated that actually we had no idea whether we can pinpoint this, um, these correlations within the basal data. And we collected data from 24 participants. We then do the Ravens in the scanner. We had a particular version of the paradigm. And if you look at the brain while they're doing the problem, it looks like a normal brain that is engaged in a highly demanding task. So essentially, frontal and parietal activity lights up. Basal ganglia is massively uh, activated, as you can see here. What is really interesting is if you look at which part of the brain is correlated with the accuracy, meaning accuracy over the 16 problems, you found that again, you have mostly subcortical regions and the one that survives actually error corrections is the re green region here, which again corresponds to the basal ganglia. Essentially the part of the ventral striatum and part of the dorsite is irritated by dopamine, which suggests once more that uh, this is the part where you find um, where you find that higher level cognitive functions are affected by subcortical regions. So I, I finish actually now my two to four here. Uh, there are some implications for this. Like of course the main important and most important one is that there are individual differences in basal ganglia function that reverberate across different domains. And that's the reason like I've been excited to see like work with deep reinforcement learning, especially work by Matt Bovinic and his team at Deep uh, Demand showing that uh, basal ganglia or reinforcement learning could work to set up prefrontal cortex as a meta reinforcement learning, setting up prefrontal cortex to learn different features over time. Uh, we have chosen since then to look at this from a different uh, point of view and see whether this idea that basal ganglia can modulate effects could be captured if we do models of functional connectivity of brain uh, networks, essentially creating big models of network connectivity and comparing it with uh, real data. In this case, we uh, looked at uh, different uh, subsets of the human connectome project and see whether modulatory models perform better than non-modulatory models. And so far, we found over three different studies that they tend to perform better. They tend to explain brain activity better than non-modulatory models. Again, suggesting that there is this effect of basal ganglia modulation on cortical activity. And that's it. Uh, a few uh, months ago when the quarantine started, I decided I was gonna end all my talks with a meme. And uh, this talk is no exception. And this is my final conclusion slide. Thank you all for, the, uh, for your attention. And I'm gonna go back to answering the questions.
Thanks, Sandra, for this great talk. Um, so, so I, uh, I've been holding out some questions here on the on the Slack. So, one of them is um, that uh, is the um, is the uh, choose or avoid comparable to the uh, exploration and exploitation trade off. Um, not really. So we thought that we thought about it for a while, and uh, and then we we actually could not find a direct connection. I thought. Although some, some people pointed out that there might be a connection, especially with avoiding and, and with avoiding and D2, therefore, and being having a bigger tendency to explore. Uh, what we found out uh, was that actually we couldn't find, at least behaviorally, a stronger correlation between avoiding and exploring, at least in behavioral tasks. Um, what we suspect is that actually it is the, the, the correlation that we found a little bit of a function between the, how we set up the tasks and the, and the particular choose and avoid dynamics. All the tasks that we use in the lab, and this is a function of how people tend to think about higher recognition, are tasks for which it's advantageous to discard things. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, this is very true in intelligence tasks that are designed to trick you into following like essentially local optimizing reasoning. And for this reason, we found these things. I'm sure that if we had design cognition currently task in a different way, we could find effects for, you know, avoid uh, choosing. Right. Um, uh, there was an, uh, um, uh, also another question from the, uh, from the chat. So this is a more general question about uh, dopamine. Is it, um, is it as a, so this saying that this, this is, uh, a talk about dopamine being a re used for a reward mechanism, but there's also uh, situations in which it can be used for non-reward. Oh yeah, this is this is one of the one of the I would say like great issues. Like um, every time I give a talk like this, I start with this kind of like big introduction where I say like uh, blah blah blah, and yes, basically dopamine is reinforcement learning is the reward prediction error and so on. And this is just like it's it, um, in, a, in a way it's been like the magic bullet or a bullet of this research because it, it's, it's kind of like incredible how it explains the data but on the other hand it is an oversimplification and dopamine is related to other effects including like there is a one thing that is particularly fascinating to me is that there is a massive uh, novelty signal that drives dopamine that is not necessarily tied uh, to reinforcement learning per se or necessarily explained easily by reinforcement learning models unless you start applying corrections. Uh, but there are other, other effects, like there is no obvious reason why, uh, for instance, dopamine should be so much driven by social interaction or by seeing like social stimuli like faces or people holding hands or things like this. You can of course like make up stories about the fact that this stimuli could be rewarding in itself. Um, and there are some kind of rewards that are Hawaii in our brain, but it's a little bit like forcing the forcing the framework in many ways. Actually, related a, to that, I have. Sorry, Chichi. Uh, go ahead. Uh, no, I, I just have a question. I was wondering, how would your results change if you? Because um, right now, probably your results would change if you're in different motivation mo motivational states. For example, if you only give somebody a very short time to to give an answer, if if you don't, then something bad will happen to you, right? So uh, how, can you say something about that? Like, how would you... uh, yes, uh, this is actually like a, a really tough question to answer. So there's been like a lot of effort to tie motivation into this reinforcement learning framework. And I would say that there have been um, mixed successes. Uh, there's been a, a um, motivation is actually one of the things in which we know dopamine seems to be involved. And it seems to be related paradoxically not to the, uh, the phasic changes in dopamine, which is the thing that reinforcement learning seems to explain so well, but to the tonic, how much dopamine seems to be available over a long period of time. Um, some people, including Yael Niv, I propose like beautiful frameworks that say like, well, you know what, you can imagine the motivation is just like you expected rewards over a long period of time, like your rate of rewards. And if you think that you over, overall you're doing well, you're more motivated than if you think that overall you're doing bad or you might be doing bad. And some people like Alison Artcock have shown that this is not necessarily true. There seem to be like 
uh, intrinsic differences, you know, people are motivated and to a certain extent, they seem also to be hardwired. There are some things that motivate individuals uh, that seem to be likely in the, uh, largely independent from this. Um, motivation is, I will say, like the one thing that we need to explain the most, especially in these experiments, because um, I, one thing that you probably all notice is that compared to other talks that I've seen here, all the R values that presented, partly because we are in, in behavioral domains, are disappointingly low. This is not unexpected uh, in behavioral studies, but there is a huge variance in what you get when you get uh, undergraduate in the lab, and there is a good variance in how much they are willing to do anything, which is, uh, again, related to what, uh, how much they are motivated to do a task at all. And to the best of what we know, we couldn't find any obvious correlation between the performance in this simple task, like the PSS, and the measures that we get, and any obvious measure that will track like effort, which is our best proxy for motivation. Like how hard are you willing to work in this task? Mm, I see. Maybe you need to zap them or something. We actually <laughs> tried, we actually tried that. We, we tried with TMS and TDCS <laughs> and and we actually got to the point where actually we got them to do better uh -huh. in a couple of tasks, but not, uh, not in a way that would actually make sense. I see. And I we see suspect you're, you're that actually we got them. Par uh, Par Parkinson's patients actually provide uh, some, some evidence uh, because they have uh, decreased tonic dopamine. And interestingly, they move slower. Mm -hmm. they, you know, they just move their arms more slowly. They don't know that it's slow, but that's, it has something to do with speed. And also, uh, they have trouble initiating action. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it, it, it's more complicated than pure motivation. It has something to do mm -hmm. with uh, how, how fast, uh, how, how, <clears throat> how, uh, how much effort you're willing to put in. Right. Um, we actually have, have uh, recently started um, a study on Parkinson patients, uh, hoping to actually get better results and to understand better what's going on. Um, the interesting thing with Parkinson is that before, you know, like, uh, like every kind of like naive researcher, I was really excited about the idea of seeing patients. And like every naive researcher, when I actually got to see patients live, I was uh, kind of like shocked at the fact that um, they are in many ways even messier than normal subjects. There is not like a single type of patient. And there are a lot of social and factors that come into play that make things more complicated. For instance, like uh, one thing that surprised me was how much these patients were actually motivated like by other things. Like they, they want to come to the studies because despite whatever we tell them, they believe that just by coming to the studies, somehow they are going to get better or get better treatment. And, uh, and they, they feel also an obligation or a duty to their family to be part of something to get better. And this was really sad for us because, uh, you know, we, we, we feel that we are kind of like, despite what, uh, what we keep doing, we feel that we are leading on, leading them on. And, and also it's like, it's kind of like this difficult confound to, to, disentangle from their data. Okay, thank you, Andrea. I think we should uh, uh, move on. Uh, uh, and I think for other questions, you're definitely welcome to uh, post them on, um, on on the channel or directly to Andrea. Um, Emre, don't forget to stop the recording and start a new one. Uh, thank you. Yeah.